Okay, well, I'm really sorry that I can't be here this evening, or there this evening. I am here, at home, which you can see is actually really quite a nice um, shot, and I'll say a little bit more about that as I go through my talk. But let me start with a very basic insight. Most of what we do simply comes about rather than being thought about. You're making up to 10,000 decisions every day. Most of those you don't think about. And actually, if you did have to think about them, your head would explode. What your brain tries to do is it really wants to make life easy for you. It tries to create habit loops. That's why I know all of us for sure have had times where we thought, have I turned the oven off? Actually, did I turn the oven off? And you don't know whether you have or not because it's an automated process. So you're essentially lazy and you want to save energy. And so most of what you do simply comes about rather than being thought about. Now, you don't really know that or think that because the only bit that you've got conscious access to is your thinking brain. It's a bit like a, like a, you can see this as like a film where you've got a main actor and the very bit part players and you think that your conscious mind is the main actor, but it's not. The main actor in the film is your unconscious automatic brain. This is what we call system one. This is your old evolved brain that essentially tries to make life easier for you. Your thinking brain doesn't actually do very much. And that's actually quite good, really, because if we're thinking about trying to change people's behaviour, it's very hard to change people's minds. If you actually think about the, the, when you last changed your mind about anything meaningful, it was probably quite some time ago, if you ever have. And that's because you essentially hold something to be true. You seek out evidence that shows that you're right. And of course, when you find that evidence, you know you're right. When you find evidence that doesn't support what you think to be true, you're very clever at being able to find a counterfactual or explain why that evidence doesn't apply to what you hold to be true. You carry on even more right in knowing that you hold that thought. So um, it's really hard to change minds, but thankfully we don't need to do that. When we're trying to change people's behavior, we can change environments and context within which people act. And neuroscience, economics, and psychology have really taught us over the last 20 years or so some of the associations that your brain's brain makes in order to help make those 10,000 decisions every day. And, um, I don't know, about five, six years ago, we were asked to try to essentially gather up these insights in ways that could be useful for public policy makers. And we wrote a report called Mindspace, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, I'm not going to go through those elements now, the important point I think that I'm going to talk a bit more about is it's a checklist. And checklists are incredibly powerful and useful. Checklists actually first came about for major use in the airline industry, where literally planes were falling out of the sky for really obvious reasons, like the co-pilot wasn't sitting next to the pilot. And what the checklist does is it draws attention away from something that we know to be called inattentional blindness. When the pilot's sitting at his instrumentation, he checks that he's got the things, like lights that are on should be on, the ones that are off are off, do the things move around in the ways that they ought to, completely unaware of whether to check that he's got a pilot sitting next to him, his you know, co-pilot. And the plane takes off and the plane crashes without the co-pilot. What checklists do is they draw you back from the narrow focus um, they've been used in surgical operating theatres and essentially really obvious things like have I got the right patient, check, this is left hip replacement, check, draws attention away from things that people miss when they're narrowly paying attention to something in the narrow focus. So uh, armed with that evidence and information and understanding, we essentially wrote Mindspace as a checklist for trying to change behaviours, M-I-N-D-S-P-A-C-E, you can read that at your leisure. What I want to talk about today, though, is something that I think will be more interesting for, for this audience, which is about the design. Now, um, given that we're making, that our brain is making these kinds of associations all of the time to help make life easier for you, if we understand how the built environment or the physical environment affects what people do, we can change the design of people's environments to make it easier for them to do things that are in their interests or that the companies or organisations would like them to do. So uh, I've got another checklist for you. Um, armed with the success of Mindspace, um, we decided to think about checklists that could be applied to the physical environment. 
And so I'm going to talk you through the elements of our new checklist called Salient, S-A-L-I-E-N-T. These are elements that the evidence tells us are significant drivers of people's behaviour, largely in ways that they're unaware of. So let's start with S. S is sound. We're influenced by sounds, but again, in ways that our automatic unconscious brain drives our behaviour in ways that our conscious mind is unaware of. So let me give an example. It's an example I, I, I know many of you would have um, maybe seen some of my talks before, and I'm sorry that I'm going to use the same one again. But if you go into a supermarket and you're being faced with the choice between French wine and German wine, you are significantly more likely to buy French wine if French accordion music is playing. You are significantly more likely to buy German wine if, what's German music? Beer Keller music is playing. Now, significantly in that study, only 17% of people were aware that there was any music playing at all, and not a single person knew that, their, that what they chose was influenced largely by what they were hearing. This operates in an unconscious and automatic way. But as I say, we're now understanding the science a bit better. What, you don't really know, actually, whether you want French wine or German wine. So what your brain is trying to do is to help you out and make it easier for you. Ah, French music, French wine. German music, German wine. So if we can understand these automatic associations that you're making, we can design environments that make it more likely that people will buy French wine by playing French music, or German wine by playing German music. Um, now that's a nice sound. Well, I'm not sure I, I like either of those sounds. But anyway, um, there's, we, we, we know that noise is attention seeking particularly uncertain noise. So people, for example, will move into houses that are on main roads, where you can hear car horns going off maybe, and think that they'll get used to it. Actually, most of what happens to us in life, we do get used to. There's a very quick and often complete adaptation process. But noise is one thing that we don't get used to. And in fact, noise gets worse because it's attention seeking. You don't know when that next car horn's gonna go off. So your unconscious mind is paying attention to the fact that it might, even if you're consciously engaged in something else. That, that really drains you of, of, of energy, makes you less happy, um, in ways that you don't predict. So, in contrast, of course, the ticking clock, you would get used to that sound, because it's a tick every second, 15 seconds, whatever. And your mind can almost quite quickly you know, zone out of paying attention to the noise. But uncertainty is attention seeking. So in the design of our built environments, we need to ensure that we remove uncertainty about many things, but especially about noise. That's sound. Second element is air. I haven't got too much to say about this because there's not been very many good causal studies, but we're influenced by temperature, we're influenced by airflow. Airflow is really quite important. It's not just the temperature of a room or a hospital, a GP practice. It's whether there's airflow. I'm standing here, as you can see, I'll start talking a bit more about my house in a minute. Um, it's a really lovely airflow, and it, it just feels better. It's really obvious. And actually, it's probably worth saying now, as I say that, obvious. Many of these insights are actually obvious, but they're overlooked. We don't account for them in quite the way that we ought to, because most of us don't really appreciate just how much we are driven by situation, by the physical environment and so on. Right, that's air. Light. There's actually quite a lot of good evidence on uh, light. Um, for example, if you want to encourage creativity, um, that's more likely in rooms that are darker. Uh, one study, they asked people to draw an alien and assess whether, how much the alien looked like the human form. And the less like the human form it looked, the more it was just to be a creative alien. And weirder aliens were drawn under dark light conditions than under bright light conditions. In contrast, though, if you want people to be honest, then you want bright lights. In one of my favourite studies, um, students were overpaid by a dollar in the experiment that they undertook. And basically, the experimenters looked at whether people were honest enough to return that dollar. When people were under bright light conditions, 85% of students handed back the money. Under dark light conditions, only 50% did. That's a 35% difference in honesty 
driven entirely by an unconscious trigger, entirely by priming. Now again, significantly, it's really important that you understand this, that when we ask people why they gave the money back, they'll give a very nice, coherent, conscious system to thoughtful reason as to why they handed the money back or why they kept it. But they will, none, of them will, none of them will be aware of the fact that it was driven largely by whether it was dark or light. These unconscious processes are unconscious and automatic and operate in ways that our conscious minds don't understand. And I'll say a little bit at the end about the implications of that. That's light. Image is eye. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is basically what you have on your walls, pictures. Um, and not very much to say on causal evidence in relation to image. Although some of you will be aware in the healthcare setting of art therapy, which has been used in, ther in treatment conditions to uh, put pictures on walls to help people recover more quickly from conditions in hospitals. Um, where are we? S-L-I-A, image A. Uh, e, no, E, I can't even spell. Oh, e is ergonomics. Actually, there's hardly any causal evidence on this at all. But we all know that sitting in bad furniture is a pain. Um, Actually, very interesting, there is some new evidence that I'm, I'm sure some of you will know about standing desks. And just standing, generally, is actually really good for us. Even if you're not exercising, it doesn't feel like you're exercising, but standing is engaging muscles um, in ways that sitting doesn't. And one of the biggest health challenges right now is the really sedentary behaviours that some people are engaging. So getting people that are just sitting on sofas to stand up, even that in itself, would have quite a significant effect on health and wellbeing. Nature, N. Now I can talk about my garden. That is a lovely view, I think. I think you can see my garden. Um, that, just looking out on greenery, makes people feel good. There's some really good causal studies in healthcare settings where people that have views of nature from their hospital beds recover much more quickly than those that don't. Um, and also, in some studies with offices where people are further away from windows, they're more likely to bring in plants. We, this is, you know, again, a really obvious but overlooked insight. Um, we like being outdoors, we like plants, and we like nature. Um, and then finally, tint, tea. Tint is basically colour, but it doesn't make a nice word if you put salient. So, uh, the best field experimental data on colour comes from Olympic Games bouts between participants who are wearing red or blue, which is randomly assigned before they try killing each other in judo or other fighting bouts. Now, since they're randomly assigned, red should win half the time and blue should win half the time. But red win two thirds of those bouts. Two thirds. That is a huge difference. You are twice as likely to win if you're wearing red than if you're wearing blue. Why? Well, because red is seen as an aggressive sexual colour going forward. Those people assessing who's won, those people, judges they're called, um, are more likely to give the bout to red than to blue. It might even make the participant wearing red fight just a little bit harder. And again, this takes place below conscious awareness. Um, in, another, in another study, <laughs> this is um, where... Uh, people were asked with blue or red shapes to create a toy for a child. When they were using red shapes, the toy was much more functional than when they were using blue shapes, where the toy was much more creative. Creativity is enhanced by blue colours. By we just we just feel more innovative when we're around blue. One of the reasons why my office is blue at the LSE. It also has a high ceiling, by the way, which encourages creativity too. So um, I've got everything in my favour. So um, that's the elements of salient. We've been applying them in similar, or we're trying to, in physical environments in the same way as we've used mind space to change people's behaviour in a whole range of different policy contexts. But the checklist approach is really important, I think, because these obvious but overlooked insights um, can be gathered up in a very systematic and clear way as you work through... Not all elements are going to be useful or, or of interest in every single built environment, in every single physical space. But by working through them, you can give your space the best shot of being able to change people's behaviour in the ways um, that you would like. How am I doing for time? 
15, 10 more left. I'm going to talk for 25 minutes, by the way. One of the key things to being happy is managing people's expectations. You've got 10 more minutes off me before I finish. So in those last 10 minutes, I'd like to just say something. In fact, I'd like to have a drink. Can I have some water, please? There's probably some in that Ribena bottle. Sorry about this, people. This, this, would, this would actually be happening if I were with you. So um, I spent a long time setting up all the camera and the sound to make it perfect and then they get me standing in front of it so um, I did really tell them not to bother anyway so what I want to do now is to just give a few implications that come out of that for evidence more generally because a really important observation is that you are unaware largely of these effects that influence you in really significant ways you know almost twice as likely to be honest under you know bright light than under low light conditions and you just do not know that that means that all the traditional methods that have been used to gather insight market research customer insight let's find out what people like is largely hopeless why because the unconscious because they're not because conscious questions do not tap into the unconscious drivers of behavior the only way to understand behavior in physical spaces in any way in fact is to observe the human animal in its natural environment. David Attenborough goes out and watches tigers in the wild, and he does that without them knowing that they're being watched. That's the only way that you can really observe how people behave in natural environments. So what we need is much more live testing, more field experiments that test the impact of the elements of salient um, in natural environments. You can't ask people whether they're going to behave differently under dark light or light light, under blue or red or high ceilings or with nature, because they just, for the best way, well, they're not lying. They just don't know what really drives their behavior. So we need trials and field tests. And that's something, if anyone's interested in trying to explore how to do that with the physical environment, because obviously that's not sometimes that straightforward, then come and talk to us. Um, <clears throat> what, what I want to what I want to finish with though, and, and you'd expect me to talk about happiness at some point, by the way, buy my book if you haven't, Happiness by Design, it's absolutely brilliant, it'll change your life, um, is to talk about happiness because ultimately the design of healthcare environments, which I know many of you are obviously interested in, are about improving the health and well-being of people within those environments. And that requires us to measure it. But before that, it requires us to think about actually what it is. Now we're, we're actually not even clear about what health is. Um, the World Health Organization have a definition of health as you know, which is the complete state of mental, physical and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, by the way, when I wrote a book that was much less successful than Happiness by Design because it was aimed at an academic audience many years ago with a colleague in Tromsø in northern Norway, he was telling me about the conference that he was at where a Finnish doctor stood up when someone put that World Health, Org World Health Organization definition up and said, that is exactly how I feel when I ejaculate. Um, I'm not sure he said it in quite that accent. Anyway, um, it's very unclear about what health is. And the boundaries in, from physical health to mental health are really quite blurred. And the boundaries from mental health to happiness are even more blurred. Where does mental health and mental well-being and mental ill-being stop and happiness and subjective well-being as it's called in the academic literature start i don't actually really care because they are so blurred that i think it's in a, it, it doesn't make much sense for us to think about healthcare interventions that only impact upon health if we knew what that meant so let's we, we should be broader because the final consequence really the final consequence of anything we do in the private sphere, in public policy, is its impact on how it makes us feel. That's, that's ultimately, that's the final consequence. That's the final consequence of everything that we do impacts upon how we and the people that we care about or the people that we're intervening on feel. So it seems to me important that at some point we capture that directly. We don't indirectly go through routes that actually don't really lead us there anyway we need to directly assess the impact on people's feelings now how do we do that well at the moment there's no better way to do that than asking people in fact if i want to you know if i want to find out how you're feeling i'll ask you how you're feeling right um it may be in time and some of our latest 
research is attempting to pick up well-being and happiness through other data, conversations, people's facial expressions, a whole range of other ways that might eventually lead us to finding out how, how happy someone is or how they feel without asking them. But at the moment, self-reports are the best way to do it. And in fact, as you know, if you go to your doctor and say, I've got a pain in my leg, he or she will ask you, how much does it hurt? And they trust your self-report of the pain you're experiencing. So it's important that we capture that subjective experience. One of the criticisms of happiness and well-being research is that it's subjective. Well, yeah, that's the point. It is subjective. Because everything that we do and feel shows up in our subjective experiences. I don't really care in any objective sense, if that were measurable, how much pain is in your leg. It's how much pain you feel that matters. So we need to directly assess that impact. And the way we do that is by asking people questions. So what kinds of questions can we ask people? Well, we ask them about pain. We can ask them about misery. And we can ask them about sadness and anger and worry and stress. And we can ask them about joy and contentment and excitement. So we've got pleasure and pain, basically. Um, the emotional states that people experience as they go about their daily lives. But I think significantly and importantly, sitting alongside people's experiences of pleasure and pain, sit another set of experiences that I call purpose and pointlessness. And if, as, as an example, um, it's, it's the one that always pops into my head because it's quite a resonant one with me. Um, you know, when I'm listening to, to my kids read the same story again, or I'm helping them with their times table. There are other things that I could be doing that would be more fun. But those activities feel fulfilling. They feel purposeful, if not pleasurable. And they're worth it. And in contrast, some of what we do in life just feels like a complete waste of time that feels futile and pointless. And there's nothing worse, especially at work, than undertaking an activity that you feel is pointless. And so these are sort of non-hedonic experiences that sit alongside the traditional measures of pleasure and pain. And I argue in Happiness by Design um, that happy lives are ones that contain a good balance between experiences of pleasure and purpose. And that's not the same for everybody. Some people will be more pleasure machines, other people more purpose engines. But you need to work out what the right balance for you is. And we need to be measuring this directly Directly is the impact of the physical environment using elements of salient or some other ways of assessing physical environments as they affect people's pleasure and purpose. Because that's the final consequence. But I think importantly, we should be caring about happiness even if we don't care about it as the final consequence. You may have a view that absenteeism, sickness, productivity, pro-social behaviours, whatever, are the final consequence. Well, if you want any of those things, more, or more of the good things, less of the bad ones, they are causally affected by how happy people are. When I first came to this ha these kinds of happiness data, I thought there was probably something in misery. And there is sometimes, but most of the time, for most of the things that we want, happier people do more of it. And for the things that we don't want, happier people do less. Happier people are more engaged, more pro-social, take less time off sick, more... If, more efficient workers and more fun to be around so even if we don't care about happiness as the final consequence as I do we should be caring about it as a cause of other things that we might care about so I think I'm running out of time I think we're nearly done I'm getting the two finger salute so how would I conclude well let me start let me finish where I where I started most of what we do simply comes about rather than being thought about you're not going to change behavior just by changing people's minds, and it's really hard to change people's minds anyway. You're going to do it much more effectively, especially on large scale, by changing environments, the situations within which people act. A big part of that environment is the physical environment, the built environment. And I've talked through the elements of salient that we can talk through some more if you're interested about how you can design those environments in ways that make certain behaviors and happiness more likely. And the happiness bit is important. We should be measuring directly the consequences of anything we do in the public or private space on how it makes people feel because that's ultimately what really matters. And for policy making, I think reducing misery and suffering is, is the only thing ultimately that we, should be, that we should be trying to do. We should be trying to minimize 
the real experiences of misery and pain and worry and stress and anger that people have as they go about their daily lives. And the physical environment, healthcare settings can have a huge effect on that. So that's it, that's me done. Thank you very much.